I'm a wrestling fan. Everybody knows it. And every year, you know, I go over my buddy Diamond Dallas Page's house for his annual Christmas party. And it's always an interesting party because of the people that are there. I mean, you know, I met uh, Julia Ferris, you know, the the neo uh, therapy woman that we had on. And she was extremely interesting. And then I see across the room, Buff Bagwell. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, I, I've never met Buff Bagwell. Uh, how have I not, all these years of wrestlers that I've known and participated with different promotions from the radio side of things, how have I never met Buff Bagwell? So I introduced myself not knowing what to expect. Um, not that I had any expectations, to be honest with you. And I did not want to stop talking to him because he's the sweetest man I've ever met. He's the nicest guy <laughs> I think I've ever met. Uh, and I was like, you got to come on the podcast. And he graciously said, absolutely. We swapped information. And uh, lo and behold, the man himself looking stellar, I might add, Buff Bagwell. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great, man. Uh, yeah, I do remember that night at the party, you know, and it was just, it's crazy, you know, how in life, you know, people you know, can, you know, meet you along the way and how ru a rumor can maybe get started where, you know, God, Buff was, he's, he's not a nice guy or, or whatever. And I swear I got a saying, and I, a lot of people say it, like if I, you know, if I had a penny for every time something happened or whatever, you know, they'd be a millionaire. But honestly, if I had a nickel for every time I heard, you know what, man, Bagwell, you're, you're a pretty cool guy. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I, I try to be, man, you know, but, uh, you know, and, and the persona and all that, the TV, and I think everything just gets kind of twisted around to where people think you're, you think you think you're bigger than life. And really I don't. And neither does Dallas. Yeah. And that's one of the things that drew us together from the beginning. Yeah. Well, he, it's interesting you say that because I actually thought a lot about this, knowing that you were coming on is if any, you know, there, yes, I, I believe you. That is true. Like people, whether it's because, uh, you know, of course, most people know that you've had some incidences that, that land at you in the, in the news and the paper and, 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 and you've, you've got some demons and so on and so forth, but your gimmick when you were at the top of your game <laughs> was, I mean, you were this narcissistic asshole. <laughs> and I yeah. think if anything, you know, again, I thought long and hard about this. And I was, I was like, I got to say this to him. I think if anything, if people had an idea of what you were in a negative way, it's a compliment because you lived the gimmick so well on television. <laughs> well, you know, and, and, and pro, you're exactly right. And you're exactly, exactly right. And, and with pro wrestlers, I think across the board, it's, you know, to be very interesting or to be very popular in pro wrestling, you know, you just kind of turn up the volume on your own self, yeah. you know? So it ain't like I can't find that person that's on TV. I, I know where he's living and I know where he's at if I want to knock on his door, yeah. you know, but I do got to go find him. You know, I got, I got to wake him up and go find him. So a genuine reaction to, for me would be very nice and laid back, but once you turn that volume up, you get what you saw on TV, which was, look at me, I look great, and all that stuff. So it just was, it was just a good persona, and it was, it was me just completely over-exaggerating myself. Right. And that is what a lot of wrestlers do. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of the guys in the, uh, the WCW days, the height of the WCW days, you know, for, what is it, 52 weeks is Bischoff's podcast that beat WWF at I the think time. It was eight, I think it was 83, but who's counting? <laughs> 83 weeks. So the, the, I, I don't think the WCW stars, I don't say superstars, but stars don't get the credit they deserve of the dues that they paid in order to get there. Because every single one of those guys, you in particular, and I'm really talking in particularly about you, didn't just show up at this promotion and become who you were. You had to live through many bad gimmick, gimmicks, the fabulous Fabian and all these other different things, <laughs> and work your way up through smaller promotions until you got to where you got to on national television. Man, I have never heard anybody set it up so perfect in my entire life. And my answer to that is, you're exactly right. Yes. Um, I can't tell you the times. Keep in mind, Marcus Bagwell, Marcus Alexander Bagwell and Sting are the only two guys in the WCW history 
to be in the company for the entire stint, which was 11 years. 2000 to 2000, I mean, 1990 to 2001, Sting and I were the only two that made it the whole way. A bunch of guys came and went. They went to WWF, but me and Sting were WCW for the whole 11. So we caught the whole ride. We caught the ride of going to buildings where there were 150 people. We caught the ride of nobody knowing who we were. We caught the ride of going to play golf and, and people figure you're looking at us and going, so what do you guys do? You know, we're <laughs> like, uh, and we, the last thing you do being a pro wrestler is say, well, at least we didn't do this. And it was like, Hey, I'm a pro wrestler. That was the last thing that came out of our mouth. So it'd be like one day these, for example, at a golf, uh, thing we were doing one day the guy goes so what do you guys do and we dodged it we were like oh we uh we work for turner and so you know whole four whole four whole five whole six come and then so what do you guys do you know and we're like, oh we travel a lot you know and finally the guy goes man well, what do y'all do man and we're like <laughs> we, we we wrestle and he goes you mean the wwf yeah. that saying was what we had to deal with for five years man which was a long five years and we were like we're wcw and they're like who mm. so nobody truly knew us man it was just a very small portion of people and we we couldn't go nowhere like the west coast um we had to stay in the south even to be kind of recognized mm. and then to ride that ride that glorious ride of nobody knowing us to Everybody wanted to know us and be us and hang out with us. It was just an incredible, incredible ride that me and Sting specifically got to ride on. It was great. When, when was that moment where you knew that you were a part of the next level in the business? You know, if you said for five years, and I remember going to an early WCW event. It was at a Civic Robarts Arena in Sarasota, Florida. And I got to tell you, it was one of the best live events I'd ever seen. And I think uh, like uh, one man gang was there. Sting was there. Abdul the Butcher was there. I mean, it was it was uh, it was awesome. Uh, I mean, for five bucks, right. I'm in the front row, right? And Stevie B was performing the next night or something. <laughs> but right. but but when when was it in WCW? You were like, we've got something. Was it when Hogan came over, or was it before that? <laughs> It wasn't. It was uh, when Hogan came over, we thought, all right, man, here we go. Here we go. Hogan's here. Now we, Nasty Boys. Some names started coming over. Macho. There was names that started coming over that really we thought was going to turn the tide, you know? And we were excited, man. We were pumped. And it would be like, you know, and then when Hogan came, we knew we had it. Right when Hogan came, his very first thing was a German a Germany road trip. So we were real excited. We had the nasty boys, Hulk Hogan, you know, macho man, Sting. Now we had our guys too, Sting. And, you know, at the bottom of the card was, was Marcus Alexander Bagwell and two cold Scorpio, mm -hmm. you know, but we were the tag team of the year and I was rookie of the year, but it went, it fell, it fell on deaf ears because nobody really knew WCW, right. but that's what was going on in our world. So Germany was kind of a flop. And so we were like, oh man, that that's what's going on. That stinks. Why didn't, why didn't it work with Hogan here? You know, but then when that kind of kept going and kind of was trying to get better, but we didn't really know. And then mean Gene was with us and it was just, we were kind of failing at every star we got and it wasn't good. We were kind of like depressed about it. And then when Kevin Nash and Scott Hall came over, and started the NWO thing, man. It was, it was, it was, it was crazy. It was just, it was just like we were instantly, you know, starting to be names that people knew yeah. and household names. But when I started really knowing that I was on the scene and I was noticed, was rumors of action figures started getting out a little bit, yeah. and I was nowhere in it. And I was like, I can't believe I've been here this whole time, you know, and with my family and close friends, it was like, you know, why don't I have an action figure, you know? <laughs> and so finally I was at Ruby Tuesdays one day at town center mall in Kennesaw, Georgia. And I was eating with my wife and we're eating and we're kind of talking about it. And I see my mom and dad pull up 
And my mom's kind of smiling, walking at me at, to the windows. We're right against the window. <laughs> and she walks up and puts a, a, an action figure of me against the window. And I went, <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, when you see an action figure of yourself, made you're it there. <laughs> you may have made it. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, oh, my God, that's great. So that's when I kind of knew, okay, man, I'm. I'm on the scene now. I'm ready to go. That's a day where you get those extra croutons. Right. <laughs> you bring the extra ranch, too. Because there ain't nothing better absolutely, than Ruby Tuesday absolutely. than the croutons that they got at the salad bar. <laughs> oh, that place was the best best salad bar in the world before there were salad bars. Oh, I know. I agree. Uh, so wh- how much did you know about the NWO invasion and Hulk Hogan turning heel uh, being in the company? I mean, I'd figure you'd be a trusted source being that, there that long, being loyal. My career at WCW went, you know, Marcus Alexander Bagwell by himself, Rookie of the Year. And then it, I hooked up with a guy named Two Cold Scorpio, and we were Tag Team of the Year, and then that, which was great for, for me, but again, on deaf ears kind of. And then, um, you know, cover of the magazine, which was huge for me, first cover. And then um, from there, I went to a thing that, I, I mean, when Scorpio got fired, I'm thinking, well, here I, I'm next. Well, why would they keep me? You know, and then they brought in Dale Wilkes, mm-hmm. uh, rest, you know, God rest his soul, and and um, he uh, came in as the Patriot, and they tagged us up as Stars and Stripes, yeah. and we were like, oh my God! I mean, every wrestling event you've ever gone to, you've heard a USA yeah. chant. Yeah. You know, it's unbelievable. It's easy to get, and people love it, and they get behind it, and it's we were really excited. And then they brought in Hacksaw Jim Duggan, Mr. USA. So two different matches on their card said USA chance. So it kind of, we were popular and we were tag, we were uh, world tag team champions twice. Um, that with that part with that tag team, but it wasn't, it didn't have the stardom it could have had by being the only red, white, blue team, you know? And, uh, so, but when that happened, that then Dell then that fizzled out and Dell got fired and then I went on to a guy named Scotty Riggs which we were called the American Males mm. and that was kind of like I, I went to WCW and was trying to tell him I said listen man goatees and earrings and stuff I said it's not a bad guy anymore I said guys can have goatees and earrings and have their hair cut edgy and then be good guys and they didn't they wasn't with me at first so I shaved my goatee off. And they call me back up before our tapings in Disney, and they go, hey, Bagwell, do you, uh, you still got your goatee? And I go, I just shaved it off. They went, well, we're going to go with your idea. And so I was like, oh, my God. So my goatee grew back kind of enough for the tapings. And, but we did the blue jeans, yeah. the American male stuff, man. I mean, earrings, chokers. And it was really kind of edgy, but borderline, you know, but it got over. And that's right at the end of our tag team was the beginning of the NWO. Mm -hmm. When I joined, Mm -hmm. I was world tag team champs as the American males. And when, uh, when Scott, Scott, I mean, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash and Hogan were doing, they've already, the heel turn had already happened. And there was like five or six guys is that, that was it. And the night Bischoff, we was in Salisbury, Maryland. I'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Kevin Nash came up to me and he goes, Hey man, what's up? I go, Oh, not much. What's up, man? He goes, um, do you want to be in the NWO? And I went, are you kidding? I said, yeah, absolutely. And he goes, well, uh, here's what we're going to do. So they laid it out and Eric goes out that night and he, a- he actually puts a thing out on the microphone. He says, listen, you know, you got 30 days from today to join or you're fired. And that was the storyline we went with. Yeah. So the first one out of the gate was the American males came out yeah. and they were like, Oh my God, there's Scotty Riggs and Buff Bagwell. I mean, Marcus Bagwell. Here's Scotty Riggs and Marcus Bagwell. What are they doing, you know? So I turn, we get in the ring. And when I get in the ring, I see all that talent in there, man. It was, it was crazy. I mean, it's Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, Hulk, Hulk Hogan, Bischoff, the Giant, X-Pac, Vince. You know, it was, it was just incredible. You know, Vincent was in there and it was just all the stars. And so I turned on Scotty and left him laying. And I use Rick Rude's Rude Awakening is what I use. I like that move. Mm. And I trans, mm. I trans, you know, poured that thing till doing the neck breaker, but kind of off the top rope. Mm. And it was called the blockbuster. And that, that's a really good move that I started. And, but that's why I started in the ring. I just dropped him with that one move. And I was in the NWO. 
And so I think I was like the seventh person, but man, that's when I really knew, here we go. Yeah. When did you know Hogan was going to turn? Um, when I saw it on TV. <laughs> you, so you weren't, you weren't at Bash of the Beach. You weren't at the Ocean Center in Daytona. I, I was there, but I mean, I saw it, you know, live like everybody else did. Uh, oh, okay. You were on the call. I was there yeah. that night. And I told you this at, at Dallas's party. So my growing up in high school, my neighbor was Mean Gene. And uh, I remember call, I, I, I was going to UCF at the time and Scott Hall worked out at the world gym uh, that yeah. I worked out at by UCF. And I remember, you know, we'd see him, but we never talked to him and just didn't give him a space. And I remember going up to uh, him right before bash of the beach. I'd called Gene up and he'd give me tickets in his section or whatever. And like if you, there's a, there's a, there's a frame where you can stop it and you can see me. I'm wearing my fraternity Jersey in the top left-hand corner. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And, and, yeah. and so I remember going up to Scott Hall and I said, excuse me, um, Mr. Hall, I said, uh, uh, I hate, I'm sorry. He was on the, uh, the, the leg press machine. And I said, could, I'm just curious, you know, I'm going to be there Saturday night. You know, me and Gene was my neighbor and this, this, and that. And, and he's in character, you know, he's like, Hey, yo, you know, that kind of thing. And I go, could you tell me who the fourth member is? I'm just curious. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he goes, who do you think it is? And I said, I got to tell you, I think it's Yokozuna. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you were way off. <laughs> he goes, he goes, he laughs. He goes, oh, no. He goes, you want to try again? I said, it, it's got to be Bret Hart then. It's got to be. He goes, you're going to have to wait and see you. <laughs> and, and you know, and you know what the truth of that story really is? He didn't know. I didn't know. I don't think nobody knew. Really? I really don't. Wow. Yeah, that's how much it was happening to all of us very fast. Mm. I mean, Scott Hall knew what they brought to the table, but you got to realize things like in the locker room were posted everywhere that you couldn't say the word Razor Ramon and you couldn't say the word Diesel because of Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. If you said those words, WCW got fined $10,000. Wow. So we had that kind of stuff going on that was just unreal, yeah. you know, really hard stuff in the locker room and, and on TV that you had to be very careful because things were millions of dollars were exchanging hands and TV ratings and a lot of stuff was going on, man. So truth be known, Scott Hall had no idea that four, five, six, seven, eight, nine was going to happen. It just it just happened along their storyline and who can we do this week? And as soon as that show was over, like on Monday night nitro on Tuesday morning, they were trying to figure out what to do for Thursday night thunder. Yeah. You know, and thunder, when thunder was first thought of, we all were like, when Eric came to us and said, we got another show. We, we knew that was ultimately not going to be a good thing. Right. And we were like, you know, Eric, man, you don't need to do this. And he said, well, they've told me that if I don't, you know, they'll find somebody else. No. So as Eric did say, he said, look, man, this is going to be hard to have two popular shows. So we knew in the long run, it wasn't going to be good. And at the first we, the way Eric had it laid out was way before Vince had a SmackDown and a raw. This was the first time there was a big company with two shows. And when that happened, Eric's first idea was to have the B team guys on thunder. And then the A, a team guys were nitro on Monday night, and then Thursday night Thunder was going to be the B team. And then the first ratings come in of the B team Thursday night. And let's just say I wasn't, I was never off another Thursday night ever. <laughs> so the B team thing didn't work. So yeah. it just ended up being another 52 dates a year for the A team guys. Mm. So, which we loved it, man. It was TV. We were popular. It was a real, real wonderful, great time even for superstars like Nash and Hall and Hogan. It was a it was a, a run they'll never forget. And it was a run that I'll be part of for the rest of my life. But it but it changed you guys personally, right? I mean I remember seeing, you know, Scott go down to Zuma Beach, downtown Orlando, wearing, you know, forget I don't know the guy he was always with, but I mean he was in character wearing NWO gear. I mean he was living the gimmick. Um and I mean, in more ways than one, you guys, you know, I know a bunch of stories that you, one would not think, you know, somebody would do, but I think you guys probably got wrapped up in, in all the attention. Did you not? 
Yeah, absolutely. And answer the T-shirt stuff, the NWO shirts and stuff like that. I, I really thought back when you said that and really 100% of everything that I've kind of shared with you, but this being the biggest of all on how big a star I kind of was starting to be was I wore an NWO tank top to Six Flags. And the group I hung out with, this is not bad or good either way, but the group I hung out with, you did not wear a wrestling t-shirt. You did not wear a t-shirt with your name on it. You did not wear a, I'm a wrestler t-shirt is how my, my buddies talk to me about it. Right. Your Nashes, your Stings, your Lugers. If you were caught with a wrestling shirt on trying to be cool, you got dogged out. Yeah. <laughs> but wearing an NWO shirt for anybody back then was super cool. Well, I wore it to Six Flags not knowing what I was really doing. And I went to Six Flags and it was like, I was like a, the biggest rock star in the world. Mm -hmm. And I could not believe it. So much of a rock star that I never did it again. I never wore NWO shirt in public again, wow. unless I was at a signing or something like that, because it was so, look at me, that it got heat with your star buddies. Yeah. So if you didn't get noticed on your own like this right here, then you shouldn't have been recognized anyway is how they thought. Yeah. So even though everybody, but everybody did go into that world a little bit of wearing the NWO shirt because it was cool. It was cool and you didn't get dogged out for being like, look at me. Right. It was just a great shirt. But that NWO Six Flags Day, Man, I was like, man, this is this is bigger than I thought. This is big. As of today, uh, and when we air this, so I, I don't want to give an exact number, but you are well over 150 days sober, um, from yeah. what I understand, and that's awesome. Congratulations, and I'm very, very Thank happy you. and very, right. very proud. Um, going back, and I'm going to talk about the the quote unquote reality show because it's not really a reality show, but it is uh, that that you're a part of with Dallas. Do you think that the demons that that got into you and the incidences that you happened um, all here in Georgia with, with law enforcement and whatnot are a direct result of that fame from the NWO and, and, and your wrestling career? Um, I really don't think so. Uh, it definitely had a, a big part to play in it, but we were dabbling um, – you're, we dabbled in, 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 in prescription pills, all, and most wrestlers do that because of injuries. Um, I broke my neck in uh, 98, and I was fused at 3, 4, 6, 7. And um, so the, that was my first, you know, really of having my own prescriptions in my name was the first time was 98. But up till 98, everybody knew what a pain pill was. Everybody knew what a soma was was and soma just happened to be uh if there's a such thing a perfect wrestler's cigarette let's call it mm. um a couple of somas to a wrestler was 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 a perfect window for not messing up their next day not messing up their night just having a cigarette like somebody would smoke i would call it like having a cigarette having a couple of somas was like drinking four beers because all we had was a few hours to do anything before we were in bed, up, back to the gym, back to the event, and back doing wrestling again. So uh, a couple of somas at the end of the night, we went off TV, you know, like, <laughs> you know, just out of breath and just winded. Everybody else turns their TV off and goes to bed. Well, we walk out of the ring, have to shower off and go to the hotel and do it all over again. Mm. So we had to find something that took the edge off briefly enough that it wasn't hard on your system. It wasn't bad on you. And, uh, and you could get to where you had a little bit of a buzz. They made you hungry. They made you sleep afterwards. And then when you got up the next morning, there was no hangover. It was like, talk about addiction. Wow. Is that not addicting the way I just explained that? It was crazy. So a lot of wrestlers were hooked on Soma, you know, including myself, but not to a high number because there was that leash of WCW mm. and the leash of the money we were making. So as long as that leash was on, everybody was pretty good. Well, then I found out in my walk that when that leash was off, 
those numbers got real high. And then depression from losing the job. I mean, who thought Ted Turner was going to lose the company, right. especially to Vince? It was no way, right? Yeah. And then I found myself in that situation of my contract comes up the same month Vince takes over. So I went from a million dollars a year to 175000 a year. Wow. Now, granted, 175000 is still a lot of money but it's not a million. Wow. And that means I had to sell my house, my, my bikes, my Jag, everything had to go out. And then I made pretty good money at 175. But you're talking about depressed. Wow. And then three months into that, they fired me after the very first match. Mm -hmm. I'm the only wrestler, bro, to be main event one week and fired the next. <laughs> it's never happened. Right. I'm the only one. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So, you know, it just depression set in, man, and those numbers went through the roof. Was that ever a mindset that you had in particular about your future? Or did you always just say, I'm going to be a wrestler and I'll always have a place to wrestle and I'll always make money? Man, I was very, very adamant about what I'm getting ready to say. Very adamant. My parents were very wealthy growing up. Uh, so from my, from five years old, that was my first big memories. I was in a mansion with parents that made a million dollars a month at a lumber company called Southeastern Building Supply. And we were wealthy, very wealthy. Well, I grew up in a house with tennis courts. I had a batting cage in my own backyard. Oh. So we grew up very wealthy, and, but we were, we were three boys, and we were not spoiled brats. We were spoiled, but not spoiled, bra spoiled brats. My father and my mother were very great people, and they raised us the way to respect our stuff and take care of it, the things we got. And if we got caught bragging or being, you know, cocky about our stuff, we got it taken away from us or we got in trouble. Mm -hmm. So we knew the rights and wrong. And we also knew how much money we were making. And we also knew how much thankful thankfulness we had to be thankful for because of, because of where we were in life. And that's what we did. We were very thankful. But in 1988, my parents went broke. So I'm 18 years old and my parents are going broke. And and it just all caved, you know, caved in on us in 1988. And so by seeing my parents, what they went through from being rich and me, being rich as a kid, and then going broke and seeing what they were going through, when I made my money at WCW, man, I was banking on WCW going under. I was banking on the fact they may go under. I knew what I was doing for a living was extremely different and extremely, extremely special. So I got every match of mine on tape that I could prove I, what I'd done. I knew how unbelievable it was to see those biweekly checks. Every time I got a check for 11 years, every two weeks, I, no matter where I was at when I got that check, I went to a knee and I said a prayer to God because I knew that check was different than everybody else was getting. And I knew it was a big deal. So we banked on the fact that what if – because mm -hmm. what if happened to me as a kid and wasn't supposed to happen. So what if now granted when you're in that eight, nine, 10 years, you start thinking, man, we're, we're pretty good here. Let me, let me go ahead and build my big house. Yeah. So you did stuff like that maybe, but you didn't, you know, go like I'm good forever. Hell no. I mean, you actually did a few things and kind of was a little bit experimental, but you definitely didn't go all the way with it. So I built my big house I had a nice car, and from that point on, it was buckled down. Yeah. WCW was out of business. <laughs> so, you know, you, I didn't put all my eggs in the basket, so to speak, but you just kind of by accident do that. I mean, you're living, you're working in the company, and like I told somebody the other day at the PC here, I said, you know, I got no regrets. I said, if I would have saved every dime I made, I probably could have not worked after WCW for a couple of years. I said, or I could have lived like a rock star, just like I did and had the best time of my life and go to work right after it went out of business. Uh -huh. And to me, that was well worth it, man. I got pictures, I got proof. I got a memory of the best time I had in my life that 11 years. And I got no regrets 
but it does happen and it can happen when your company goes out of business that you're in a, in a bind. Yeah. So when that happens, um, it's WCW purchased by, well, it's WWF at the time, March of 2001, mm-hmm. I believe. And yeah. uh, I remember watching the, the, from Daytona beach and you know, <coughs> Shane comes on and, and the whole, the whole bit there. And you then go to WWF and are fired. What a week after you wrestle Booker T and they fire you in Atlanta, um, yes. your hometown, which is crazy. But why, crazy. why you were, you were such a, uh, in my opinion, as a fan, you were the perfect utility player. Like you can made of kind of like what a Dolph Ziggler is now, right? You can main event. Yes. You can carry a storyline. You can uh, bring up young talent. You have the look. You obviously have the the gift of gab. You've got everything that a a great, not good, great pro wrestler should have. Why in the hell would they not keep you on their roster? That is the million dollar question. And um, the how it broke, how it came down to me was, um, um, you know, again, you just. When, when the merge, when we walked up, I was with about $12 million worth of talent. Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, Goldberg, Sting, Luger, me, all the guys that show up late. <laughs> and we're showing up late at, the, at, at Panama City. We have no idea any, it somehow, Vince buying our company did not get through the grapevine at all. Mm. And we show up at WCW event at Panama City. And when we're walking up, I'm the one that notices from the distance, I go, Oh my God! What are what are the WWF semis doing here? Oh, there were WWF semis there, and I, and everybody was like, "Oh my God!" And nobody said a word. Everybody just spread out and went to the people they know to find out what was going on. And within five minutes of that, I noticed people crying, like office staff crying, and people taking picture with Ric Flair and the belt, like people in the company in the office and it was just a weird setting and then all of a sudden somebody comes out and says yeah uh shame it man's got a meeting in this room in two minutes so me and luger were tag team partners at the time we were totally buff and we went to the into the room together as a tag team and we're sitting in there and shane walks in and shane goes how are you doing? I'm Shane McMahon. He goes, um, we now own World Championship Wrestling. He goes, um, we're going to keep some wrestlers. We're going to fire some wrestlers. He said, we're going to keep some refs. We're going to fire some refs. He said, we're going to keep some office staff, and we're going to fire some office staff. He goes, so um, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> and I look at Luger what to do. And Luger don't ask a question. I don't see no hands raised. And so he goes, Thank you, guys. Uh, the, the sheet will be over here if you need have any questions. He walks out to half of a room going, <laughs> and Luger wasn't doing this, so I didn't do this. <laughs> I was like, well, do I clap or not? So I did what Luger did, and nobody clapped. So we go, we proceed to find out if we're on the show, and we're guessing at that stage, if you're on the show, you're in. If you're not on the show, you're out. Well, we look at the card, and me and Lex are not on the very first Monday Night Nitro that Vince bought the company. And we were like, well, it's over, bro. You know, it's over. So I walk to, I go to the car. I'm leaving. I'm going home. I'm depressed. I'm going home. I'm not going to stay around and watch my life go down the tubes. I'm going to go back and try to figure something out, what I'm going to do next. Mm. So I get in the car, and I see Lex Luger running to me. And I'm going, Wow. I put the car in park and he goes, look, man, we're on the card now. we got an interview. So back out, you know, get ready, you know, warm up. Do the, I do an interview. And so if you watch the show back from years ago, the very first Nitro, I've never seen it. But I'm on the show doing a little vignette interview of something. Don't know what I said. Don't know what it was about. It wasn't big enough to really count, but I knew I was on the show. So I was maybe kind of in. Well, on the way home, my phone rings, and it's my father. And he goes, hey, man, where you at? I go, I'm on the way home. He goes, so you, you don't, you're not watching the show? I go, no. He goes, they just said your name on the WWF show. And I said, what? And he goes, 
Shane, and what, it, what really happened when I watched it back was Shane and Vince are talking via satellite. Mm-hmm. Right. And Vince is in Cleveland, Ohio at the WWF show, and Shane is in Panama City at WCW show. And Vince goes, he, him and Shane are talking, and Vince is like, you know, who, who are you going to use? You know, Hulk Hogan? And was seeing, I think he was seeing what kind of pops right. that our names would get and kind of throwing a little jab at Shane, so to speak. Out of those five names that came out of Vince McMahon's mouth, I was one of the five. And from people telling me, not just my opinion, it got the second biggest pop. Wow. It got a really good pop. I think Goldberg's was the biggest, and I feel like mine was the second biggest. Regardless, it was the top five. Yeah. Out of that, again, I didn't, I didn't act like anything. I just act like, well, that's got to be pretty good. But everybody else is like, man, you're in, you're in. And I'm like, don't say that, man. You never know, you know, <laughs> you're, you're, you're definitely, in. you're definitely in. So it was assumed that Buff Bagwell was exactly what you just said. Yeah. Man, he's definitely got a job. Buff Bagwell's really in the zone. He can be an ultimate player at any level. Yeah. Man, he can talk. He looks damn good. He's in good shape. I mean, hey, man, this Buff's okay. And you're kind of thinking that as your buff Bagwell, but not fully because I'm worried. And then um, d- the night, the, the Monday Night Raw comes up, and I'm main event with 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 Booker T. Yeah, but we're in uh, what part of Seattle? Tacoma. I can't believe I almost forgot that. My last match, which I thought was going to be my first, was Tacoma, Washington, main event on Monday Night Raw. And I'm thinking, wow. all right, man, I'm in. Nobody comes to us with a finish. There's always a finish you go over with matches, especially the main event. And, and, and at WWF, it's Pat Patterson. Yeah. Pat Patterson is a specific agent that does the main event matches only. And he didn't come to us. And Johnny Ace was kind of taking care of all the WCW guys. And he didn't come to us. So me and Booker just kind of lay a little match out. And Stone Cold walks up and says, look, uh, when you're you know, getting some heat on Booker, when he starts making his comeback, me and Kurt Angle are going to hit the ring. And we're going to jump on Kurt. And we're going to throw you guys out of the back of the building. And da 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 So I said, okay. So we do the match. And we do what Stone Cold calls Stone Cold said so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we did it. And we, we go through the match. And... We have what I think is a very logical, non, no mistakes, good little match. May not have been a main event match, may not have been a great match by no means, but it was not a bad match. The, so we do the match, we go backstage, and Stone Cold and Kurt are doing the thing, and the cameras are still rolling, and they throw Booker out the back, <clears throat> and they throw, they go to go through, we all throw Booker out the back. And then I'm like, hey, all right, man, what do you think about that? Well, they kick me, beat me up, and they throw me out the back, too. Mm. And that's how the show ends. But the whole problem me and Booker are worried about the whole time was, why are we doing the first match of what they're calling the invasion, the WCW invasion? Why wouldn't we wait to invade in Atlanta seven days from now? Mm. So we were very worried about it. Not really knowing what we were worried about, but this didn't make sense. Why not just wait seven more days and get that great pop and we're in WCW and do the invasion with Booker T and Buff Bagwell in Atlanta? We got booed out of the building in Tacoma. Mm. So we were really worried about it. Well, going into the week, Jim Ross calls me up and says, hey, man, we got big plans for you Monday night, Bagwell. Big plans. I said, all right, thanks a lot, Jim. He goes, take the weekend off. We got big plans for you. Well, I show up on Monday night for Monday Night Raw, family, friends, tickets everywhere, and they fired me. You know, it was just crazy. They fired me. And, um, and they called it releasing me. And I raised my hand, and Vince said, like, what are you raising your hand for? You got to raise your hand, Mark. I go, I feel like I do. I go, what's the difference of being released or being fired? And they had an answer, and they had it fast. They said, well, if we, if we release you, we can bring you back in three months. And if we fire you, we got, we can't, we got to redo your contract. And I just went to my mind. I went, start smiling and start shaking hands because it's over. Yeah. 
And I did that and it was over. Uh, I called back in three months. They act like I was crazy to even call them back. And I never went back there again. It was over. So we just don't know what happened to this day. I would give a 10 year long contract. I would give that up to know the truth. Wow. Do you, do you think that with, with the, the purchasing of WCW, yeah. there was a lot of animosity from the WWF wrestlers, especially those that were there that probably had a bad taste in their mouth from their WCW days, like maybe Steve Austin or Jericho um, or Guerrero, you know, th- those guys that, uh, that they, they're like, well, this is going to be my, this is going to be a way I can get my receipt on, on certain guys from WCW. No doubt. There's no doubt about it. That was there. Even when I walked in as a 30 year old man, but really a kid in this business still, I walked in the WWF excited. I was excited. Like, Hey Steve, Hey Stone Cold. I was all excited, man. And I got this. Wow. And I was like, Oh man, what? And I realized pretty quick that I was just going to take somebody's job away. Yeah. That's all it was. And it wasn't cool. And it wasn't welcoming. It wasn't like, hey, glad you're here, guys. It wasn't cool. It wasn't friends. It was right back to the chopping board of finding your spot because everybody, I was a threat. And I was a big one. I was a bigger one. I was a bigger threat than I thought. Mm -hmm. I really thought it was going to be a friend and happy to see you. And let's have some fun together and be the WWF together. It was absolutely not that way. It was a threat. I was Buff Bagwell. I was good at what I did, and I was a threat to them, a threat to their job, and a threat to their food in their mouth Yeah, that deep. And it was, I understood it. By the time I understood it, I was fired, which nobody understood, but it is what it is, you know. But there's also the incident, at least according to the internet, with Shane Helms, right, that could have played a part. Yeah, the Shane Helms thing um, was, uh, we was at school. They made us go to school. And um, long story short, we, at the end of the sc- uh, school, uh, epi- we had a class one day down at the WWF school to get used to the 20 foot ring. Our ring was 18 foot. WWF's is 20 foot, and two feet's a lot, when, especially in the pro wrestling world. And so we were getting used to the ring and everything. Well, that day, Shane did not, you know, kind of, he wasn't in the group uh, with our class. And it got to where all the boys kind of, boys were talking and stuff, and it got a little heated. And, um, and I looked at Shane and I was like, I said, man, I, Hey man, I said, you look great today in the ring, brother. And he was like, I was, but he didn't do nothing in the ring that day. And so everybody kind of oh, laughed, you know? And he said, well, at least I'm not going bald. And I went, Whoa. And I said, wow, I'll tell you what I can't wait for. I can't wait for your first interview. Cause Shane had a little bit of a lisp. lisp. Right, yeah. And I said, it's going to sound something like this. I'm so the same helm that I'm going to be in the WWF. And the boys really lost it laughing like, Oh, so then he came back with, well, at least I'm not a drug addict. And the boys were like, Ooh, again. So it got tip for tat. And finally I said, look, bro, I can just knock you out and put this whole thing to rest. I said, so what do you think about that? And he said, take your best shot. He didn't get shot out of his mouth. Wow. As soon as I connected, I went, God, bag. Well, there you go again. <laughs> What'd you do that for? You know? So I'm walking off and bro, whack, I get hit. Shane had a ice bottle under his shirt and an ace bandage, a frozen water bottle, a brick, an ice brick that when I turned around, he took the brick out and went whack on my head. So when I wrestled that match in Tacoma, Washington, I had 20 staples in my head. Wow. 20. And again, that kind of story don't get out, you know? Yeah. So, so what, would that <laughs> have what, to, what would that have to do? Shane was a, a WWF guy at the time? Yeah, uh, no. He was just, yeah, he, a, matter of fact, when that happened, truth, the honest to God truth that Shane probably won't admit, but that's okay. The truth is, he was crying, scared to death that now he was going to be in trouble because 
Buff Bagwell was assumed he had a spot at WWF. Right. So he's crying, holding a towel on my head, going, I'm so sorry, Bub. I'm so sorry, man. And we're we're actually great friends now and and we get along real good and all that, but that's the facts. Mm. That happened that way. And he was worried he was gonna mess up his spot yeah. at the in the company. So that kind of was that was on me, you know. And so I went to Johnny Ace and told him the truth, what happened. He got us all together and he made everybody, you know understood each other and we all shook hands and all of that. And so, you know, that was the kind of the week of, and then the, and then the Monday night, you know, not a Monday night raw match with me and Booker happened. I had 20 staples in my head and we did that match and we had a house show the night before in Seattle. Mm. And then we went with Booker T and uh, me against Booker. And then the next night was Monday night, um, Monday night raw on uh, in Tacoma. And we were trying to figure out why are we not waiting till next week, you know, but we didn't. And there's a reason and I got fired. So it's weird. It, 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 you know, you hear these stories as a fan and, you know, love them are true about some of the backstage incidences, you know, the Jericho Goldberg, the Paul Orndorff Vader, right. That was that the eye thing. I was there on that one. The, 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 like he pulled his eye out or something, right? No, the eye thing was Scotty and uh, Dallas page. The, Scotty Steiner and Dallas Page was the eye thing. It wasn't the eye out, but Scotty was going for his eye to rip it out. Oh. And Dallas had a big scratch on it. That happened backstage in Richmond, Virginia. And me and Dow, me and me and Lex Luger were getting ready to do an interview live on Monday Night Nitro. And Scott Steiner was supposed to be in the interview with us. And Scotty was dogging out Dallas on live TV the segment before us. And Dallas heard it. And Dallas went and confronted him at the go position backstage, and they got in a big fight. We're, me and Lex are watching the fight as we're on set, ready to do the next segment live. Wow. And all that happened, and what happened was they just they tied up and got a little scuffle fight, and no real licks were thrown, but Scotty got to Dallas's eye and was trying to rip it out. God. And so Dallas had a big scrape on his face. I, and I then never Scotty, knew that story. I never knew that story. I, yeah, I, I, that's, I, that's I, the eye thing. The eye thing's that. Well, I know that Vader had his eye ripped out. Maybe it was during a match. I'm almost positive that somebody. somebody the eye, the eye thing got got confused with Vader on him and um, him and uh, Mankind Mick Foley's match. But but I never. I was at WCW for 11 years, and I had a fan tell me that ironically about a month ago, I think at WrestleCade, a month ago at WrestleCade. And I said, bro, I was at Wrestle, I was at WCW for 11 years and Van Va Big Van Vader's eye was never ripped out. <laughs> I was there the whole run. It was never ripped out. I was there the night Mankind got his ear ripped off in Germany. Yeah. I watched Gary Michael Capetta come back with Mick Foley's ear in a napkin. I was there wow. and Van Vader's eye was never ripped out of his face ever. So that rumor is really out there, but it's not true because I was there. What ha what what happens? You're backstage and these beasts of men are going at it, and you know it can't be good. And most likely, you're better friends with one of them than the other. Do, is there like a a a, a, a backstage uh, understanding where you, you you give them five minutes and then you get in, or what? Well, kind of. It really is kind of like that. And, you know, it's, you got a bunch of egotistical maniacs, man, all the, and all in the same locker room. And, you know, the Vader, Paul Orndorff, when I was there for that one also, and it was, you know, he, Vader, I mean, Paul had become an agent for WCW. He was coming downstairs trying to get the guys to do interviews. Finally, Leon, which is Big Van Vader, he goes, he goes, listen, old man, leave me alone. Whoa. He goes, I'll be up there when I'm ready. Wow. And Paul, here's Paul. He had his, you know, atrophy arm yeah. and Mr. Wonderful, Paul Orndorff, and he's in flip flops with his little glasses on. And I'm like, oh man, I feel so sorry for Paul. And so about that time, Vader just a big bear Paul to, to Paul's head. He comes out of his flip flops and his glasses kind of broke. And I was like, oh man, poor Paul. Paul turns and beats up Van Vader. <laughs> Barefooted, he's beating him up. He's kicking him going, take that, take that. And Vader's on the ground. And Kevin Sullivan was our promoter. He was our boss. He came in and goes, let him go. 
And so we're watching the fight, and then finally Vader gets where he's going to have Paul kind of in the corner because of his weight, uh-huh. and he's got Paul in the corner, and then that we broke it up then. Yeah. It's, it's, one so thing, it's, this, one, it's one thing to go to an event and watch you guys perform, and then it's another thing uh, to see it like when it's real. And I saw it happen yeah. once. Uh, it was in Panama City. It was the start of the NWO. It was an MTV spring break. I was there for spring break. And I did not at the time know Kevin Nash or Scott Hall. I've never met X-Pac, but uh, I kind of became friendly with Kevin over over the years, um, living in Orlando and him in Daytona and him stealing one of my lines for when he was with TNA and calling him out on the radio and he calls me. It was a whole big thing. But anyway, um, so I'm they're, they're filming some show for MTV. I forget which show it was. And they had... Nash and Hall and and X Pac uh, as like celebrity guests or something, and they would spray like water guns. You know, we're at the beach at spring break, and some dumbass kid in the front row is throwing M and M's at him or something. He's throwing like candy at him, and I remember seeing one of the guys lean down and say, "Dude, you don't want to do this. You got to stop doing this." And he gave him a warning, and he did it again. And then another one of the guys said, "Seriously." You do it again, we're going to whip your ass. And, of course, drunk, cool college kid is, hey, yeah, yeah, it's not real. You're not going to do anything. Next thing I know, all three of them <laughs> jump off the stage and chase this kid through a sea of drunk college people, including myself. <laughs> uh, Aerosmith's getting ready to play on the other side of the hill on the beach. And I'm the one, because I, like everybody else, thought it was all bit. I step in front of this kid and go, ha ha, they're going to get you. Ha ha, they're going to get you. You know, I'm all drunk college kid. And as soon as I do that, Kevin Nash comes up behind him, grabs him, tackles him, picks him up and power bombs him in real life on the beach. And the kid doesn't get up. I mean, he eventually gets up and everybody laughs at the kid. And I'm, I'm like, that was real. <laughs> you know these guys man they're all tough guys man yeah. we're all tough guys we've all been there and done that you know uh, to so to speak you know and so to see it's kind of it was kind of all in our wheelhouses to see a fight break out and everybody kind of wants to see a fight no matter what but you know i believe it or not it was a handful of times out of 11 out of 34 years of being in this business that you see blows happen in the locker room but they're they're memorable and they they go down in history because they're big. But yeah, the the Mick Foley ear thing, you know, when that's what started the whole mankind, uh, his old his old gimmick of the mankind with a mask. Yeah. He presented that to WCW and they didn't want to do it, so that's why he went to WWF, you know. And so the ear thing was like a, like a big deal in Mick Foley's life, you know. Is there Huge. do you know if there is regrets for whomever was in charge at the time of WCW with certain talent and watching them go to WWF and become, you know, mega stars would Steve Austin have become the mega star that he is today. If he would have stayed at WCW and they would have stayed in business, the answer is probably no. Um, you know, Jericho the same way, you know, a lot of, a lot of you guys weren't given the shot at WCW that the WWF gave you. Gave them. Look at Nash. Yeah. <laughs> Look at Nash. Well, Nash, yeah. Nash, I, I beat Nash every time I wrestled him in, in WCW. Here's a seven foot guy losing to Marcus Alexander Bagwell. He goes to WWF and he's bigger than God. I mean, he's Kevin Nash. He's Diesel. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's huge. So, but I'll be honest with you, like Stone Cold, he was stunning Steve Austin for us. Right. And I love Steve Austin. He's one of the best workers in the history of time. I love Steve. We were good friends. And I like Steve a lot. But he was hurt for us a lot. He tore his bicep. He had some problems during that. But him and Eric didn't get along. I don't know the, the, the truth behind that or the facts, nowhere near it. But I knew there were problems with Eric and him. But he, him leaving, at first I was like, well, Steve was always hurt for us, you know. But then he became that huge star, Stone Cold. Mm-hmm. And it was like, man, we had him. And Kevin Nash, we, we gave him four or five gimmicks. And we, they felt like we gave him enough to try to get over. And whether he did or didn't is is – is not our world anymore. We, we got rid of him. Mm-hmm. And then we see again, a second guy that we got rid of. They make a huge star out of mm-hmm. and same with Mick Foley and same with Jericho. Mm-hmm. These guys took a huge, 
Huge gamble, bro. A huge gamble. I mean, I was with Jericho when he decided to go. I was with Nick Foley when he decided to go. And I was like, Nick, you're making 180 grand a year and we hardly work here. I go, you don't want to go there. He's like, nah, I'm going, man. And the same thing with Jericho. I was like, Chris, you're making 150,000 a year. Yeah. Stay here. You're yeah. crazy. We all thought they were crazy, but we were crazy. Yeah. <laughs> they became huge stars and made a lot more money. Yeah. That's uh it's it's always interesting to see that you know, that transition. And I don't know who's uh, around you right now at, at Dallas's Performance Center, but let's give credit to Jake the Snake Roberts for the making of Stone Cold Steve Austin because he played wow. I mean, Jake, that's what we were talking about before is the guys making other guys and and Jake made helped helped make Stone Cold Steve Austin in that storyline where three sixteen was born when he was being interviewed by uh Michael P. S. Hayes. I mean that was that was it. No doubt about it. Yeah. If it weren't for Jake, it no wouldn't, doubt, wouldn't have been as great as it as it was. You know? No way, no way. Jake played a real big part in that, you know, and that's what I was always blown away about, like you said. I, I mean for Guys that know how to pass the ball to the next level, that's what this business is about. And why I just didn't fit into that zone of, of my time, you know, and get pushed to some degree was just really, it's almost laughable, except I cried a lot. <laughs> but it just, it's crazy how this business is. It's a, it's a very tough business, you know, one that people would go to WWF and come back to WCW when I was there and go, you're still here? And I'd be like, shh. You know, I survived five bosses at WCW. You know, I dodged a lot of bullets, but then it's like every bullet I dodged, I got hit with it at WWF, you know? Uh, so it's just a tough business, man. Tough. Is there anyone in the business that you don't feel outside of yourself, of course, but feel that got their due, that could have been a bigger deal for whatever the reason, whether it's demons, uh, bad attitudes, <laughs> lack, uh, but not lack of talent and lack of promise. I truly, I mean, keep in mind, I, I have hunted, wished, and looked for deeply that person to say, well, what happened to me also happened to, and I can't find them. Hmm. I want to so bad find somebody I can say, well, you know what? I'm not the only guy, but I am. I'm one of the only guys or the only guy I know. And whoever listens to this podcast, please contact me at MarcusBuffBagel.com on my website or MarcusBuffBagel, anything, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, anything. And let me know if you know somebody else that had the run I had with five world tag team championships with, with four different guys and, and had the career I had and then get fired after a week at WWF. Mm -hmm. I mean, please let me know because I want to know somebody else got screwed like that, but I don't know nobody else that did. It's just unfortunate. It cost me millions of dollars. And the rumor of all the whole thing was my mother calling was a rumor that got me in trouble. Calling for, for my, what? To getting, get, like getting me out of shows or something was the rumor. And then the other rumor was that my match I had was a bad match. So my two answers to those two things are, do you get fired because your mom called? And do you get fired for having a bad match after an 11 year wonderful career? I don't think so. I think you get warned maybe, mm. but you don't get fired when you're buff Bagwell over a bad match that through the year of podcasting became not a bad match. And why did they fire you? But still, let's just go worst case. Let's say it was horrible. Let's say my mother called for a month, warn me and I would fix them, but you don't fire a buff Bible, do you in Atlanta? Mm -mm. But they did. And here I am. <laughs> yeah. I could see you doing some type of run. Cause AJ styles right now is injured and you look like AJ Styles, AJ Styles looks like you, is that yeah. he's injured but still being called out by whomever the storyline is with, and you right. take his place where you just kind of see a glimpse of your face, but not the full yeah. face. you got to have to grow your hair out and all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Just saying, just throwing that out yeah, there. Yeah, I love it. Um, 
So let's talk about the reality show. When when we're, I was, we were at the Christmas party, uh, just like every year, uh, it's it's half it's it's three quarters Christmas party Christmas party quarter uh, Diamond Dallas Page promotion party. <laughs> yes, <laughs> he's the ultimate promoter. He's he's going to promote something. Yeah. So this year there was a trailer for this, and I'm going to use the word reality show loosely. And as Dallas said that night. It will be looked at as a reality show, but it's not because it is very, very real where he takes a handful of individuals that have some demons like yourself and Butterbean and he, you guys are staying in the accountability crib, which is his old house where we used to move the furniture to do DDP yoga. And it's, <laughs> yes. it's called change or die. Uh, as of right now, it has not that I know of has been picked up, but I'm sure it will. I got to be honest with you, when he showed the trailer, which was amazingly done, I'm, uh, I'm assuming with the uh, leadership of Steve Yu, right? You know it. <laughs> you know it. I, 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 I shed a tear. It was that emotional and it was that well done where it took you on a, a, an emotional roller coaster ride. It really did. Um, you know, and, and as a fan, you know, because I don't know the other players, you know, then I know some of them are there at the party. But as a fan, you know, I don't know Butterbean all that well. He's supposed to come on the show. But I, I, I know you as a fan. I was, and that's what made me kind of shed a tear is go, I am so happy this man is back to himself. I am so happy this man is sober. I'm so happy he's getting help. I'm so happy that he's on the straight and narrow. It really made me happy as right. a fan. And I don't know if you guys know that kind of stuff, that what you do affects your fans. And it, it can hurt and yeah. it can help, you know? I don't think we fully, fully know either. I, I, I really don't. But I can tell you that, um, you know, the response and reactions and, like, your feedback on it is is huge. It's huge to hear that because... You know, when I'm watching it, I'm I'm the one I'm watching me, and even I, after seeing that, you know, probably ten times, and I was the one there during it, um, but seeing it played back to me, man, it's it. I cried. I cried that night. It was the fifth or sixth time I'd seen it. I just hadn't seen that specific breakdown of it until mm -hmm. that night, like when you saw it. And I cried mm. at me and I was really embarrassed for me, not now, but like looking at that, I was just, I was shocked on how bad I really looked and really, what was I thinking? Mm. I don't know why I would do, I don't know why. I mean, I do know why I remember why I did it. It just didn't make sense. I did that cameo that night all messed up because honest to God, it's because if I didn't do that cameo, it was a kid's birthday party that I was giving him a birthday cameo. Mm. And if I didn't do it, it was going to expire and seem like Buff Bagwell did not do what he was supposed to do. So during shooting that, the person shooting it, I got really mad at her and I said, you know, you shoot this or I'm going to beat you up or something. And she filmed all of it. And I was just, I just was trying to, be in character and play it off. And I don't know what I was doing, but that's the heart part of it was I didn't want to hurt a fan. I didn't want a fan to not get happy birthday from Buff Bagwell and overlook the fact of how horrible I looked and how messed up I was. Well, if you, when, when, when the show goes public, you also can see, Buff Bagwell going after Butterbean and trying to fight him, which I thought was <laughs> interesting. Yeah, that, that one was, uh, just real quick, was I, I was stone sober for that one, and I just, wow, I was so mad. He, uh, what brought that up was is some of the girls on the, on, the, on the filming crew, they had played back a tape. I didn't tell them to play it. Nobody else told them to play it, but they found a a video of me that I did for AHA. Um, and it was a really cool video I did, but it's, you know, it's, it's a girl's video. It's not a, it's not a guy's thing. You'd watch a guy. It's not a guy thing. It's a, it's a chick video right. that you'd watch, you know, with me making out with a chick and all that. And, um, and after it was over, 
Butterbean goes, you look like a boop to me. <laughs> I hear in the next room and I go, what'd you say, fat ass? <laughs> and of course, it elevates from there. Me and Butterbean are great friends now, but that's exactly how it went down. I was, I was mad that I got called a word yeah. that I made him mad. Yeah. And so it escalated to the video you saw, but that's what started. It was a video that he called me a name on. Yeah. That's uh, and you know, and, Crazy. And, yeah. he, and he's, you know, and, and, but, and Butterbean, uh, uh, demons as well. And he needed uh, assistance to even walk. Uh, he couldn't even walk. And, you know, so Butterbean's getting his walker going after, but I mean, it was like a mess. Anyway, Two, a bunch of crutches, a bunch of crutches flying around. <laughs> right. All right. I'm going to let you go. Um, Buff, thank you so much for the time. We look forward to the show coming out. Uh, I got your number. You got mine. So let's get you back on sooner than later, please. Uh, I just really Absolutely. enjoyed this. And, you know, maybe I'll pop over there and go grab a bite to eat or something. And, and I can pick your brain a little bit more. But really, really enjoyed having you on. Thanks for being so honest and candid. I'm sure your fans will really appreciate that. But I'm a fan and uh and i and i'm so thankful you you're doing so well i really am i really appreciate that man it means a lot to me and thanks for letting me come on the show you guys are fantastic and dallas and steve speak extremely very high of you so they're really excited i was doing this today so hi from all of us here and thanks a lot man i appreciate it thanks buff take care buddy take care pal bye steve if you can hear me bye <laughs> see ya <laughs>